Welcome to this episode on our channel as well as on the podcast for those of you who are watching or listening on the podcast. Today we're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about relationships. And I believe that what you're about to listen to and watch is going to not only dispel myth, but it's also going to bring hope and it's going to bring some truth in the midst of a lot of things that probably you have been hearing. Uh, today with me I have Ashanti and Jeff and they are both researchers. They work in this field that we're going to talk about today and they've been doing this for a long time. Um, I have come across uh, their books. You probably have seen their books for men only, for women only, but they don't just have books about for men only and women only. They also have books about marriage and research that they've done on marriage and one of the most, I would say, surprising things about marriage is your book on the good news about marriage um, that really just blew me away. I read that last year and I just, I had to repent <laughs> first for spreading um, misinformation because like everyone, I just, you know, used the first uh, line on Google, how many marriages end up in divorce? 50% you know and um, what you brought there and at first I was like that, that can't be true that just can't be true I, I can't be wrong and then when I just started to read more and more and that just really brought freedom and blessing and um, what you shared today to our church uh, when I was watching the first service live and then sitting in the second service just so much hope so much hope Thanks. Thanks. so um, welcome again and can we just uh, start with the first big myth Yes, the 50% divorce rate myth, yes. Where did that start? How did that start? How did you first come across this myth and realize it's a myth? So here's basically what happened to kind of dump us into this area of investigation. So I used to be um, a newspaper columnist back in the day when there were newspapers um, in the same way. And, and our column was syndicated at all these newspapers across the country. And one of the um, topics that I was covering was about divorce. And I wanted to correctly cite the divorce rate because, you know, it's like everybody knows it's about 50%, yeah. but maybe it's 48.7. Like I wanted the actual number. And so I did what, as a researcher, you always do, which is you go to the Bureau of Vital Statistics or you go primary to the- Primary sources. Primary sources, you go to the Census Bureau or whatever. And as I was looking at all of these statistics, I kept going, what am I reading? Because it didn't match the 50% narrative at all, like not even close. And as I started to, dive a little bit more into this, I thought, hold on a second, because Jeff and I, social researchers, we've been writing books and helping men and women understand each other and looking at marriage for years. And we had actually seen that one of the things that kills a marriage is a sense of futility. It's the belief that you're not going to be able to solve this. And, you know, the ship is going to sink anyway. Why bother working so hard to bail it out? And we have a culture-wide feeling of futility. 50% about... marriage is ending up in divorce. Yes, because the, it's flip of the coin. Flip the coin. And so I started to look at the data and go, uh, if this isn't accurate, like, that's a big honking deal. And so I started looking into this more. And it took me a long time because it is really complicated. Like roll your eyes back in your head, complicated. So I spent actually eight years working on this. Really? Yes. Because I, first of all, what I was reading, like I said, it didn't match the narrative, but then what is the right narrative? Like what's the truth? And trying to get at that, being not being a demographer, jumping into this, this relatively fresh statistician sure mm -hmm. social researcher sure demography is a completely different deal so you found something of where this actually started yes well yes. can i can i can i can i back up just a little bit on this one of the things even before shanti would had dug into this i like most people when i would hear that 50 percent divorce rate it was kind of funny because 
it didn't seem like it passed the smell test because one out of every two couples that I meet isn't divorced. Weren't divorced. So I was thinking, huh, is there just some big cohort out there that I just don't engage with, you know? And, and, and it was very interesting because it just didn't seem right, but you know, the facts I just thought are I the was facts. in church. That yes. I just thought I was in church. I was like, in church, people are just probably different. But everywhere else is, uh, people are just divorced 50%. Maybe, maybe. And, and oftentimes, if I can just say, churches sometimes would say that information and they would say it in a way to make their church look good. Mm. We don't hit the 50% divorce rate. So we're more godly. We're more you know, trying to live according to, you know, whatever. So anyways. And maybe those of you watching when they were like, why are we going to be talking about percentage? I want you to please, please listen to this. Why? Because what you just heard is when you know the truth that marriages can succeed, you don't have a 50% chance. It gives hope. Now, you may think hope is not a big deal. It's a big deal. You will see after this interview, the amount of hope, and this is not hype, hope is based on facts that you will feel is going to be incredible for you to keep on fighting for your marriage. So where did that 50% come from? <laughs> so here, here is where, when you trace it back, here is where really it started, okay? So in 1972, we're going to go all the way back to 1972. It used to be that you, before 1972, you used to have to go before a judge and, and convince them. And we're talking them. about America right now. Yeah, correct. in America, correct, correct. Correct. And you used to have to go before a judge and convince them that there was a reason to allow you to get divorced. Mm -hmm. So somebody was at fault, you know, and so there, the number of divorces was lower. So in 1972, no-fault divorce started to come into being. And so you could get divorced just because you wanted to, right? And so there was this immediate, fast spike in divorces because people kind of rushed to do it. And the demographers of the day went, whoa, this trend line is crazy. If this keeps up, we're going to hit 50% someday. It's a projection. We have never hit 50% for society as a whole. Even today, you will see some demographers who are determinedly gloomy. <laughs> they continue to project. It's not, they're no longer projecting 50, but maybe they'll project 42% or something. But we've never come close. And what happened is in 1980, so pretty fast, so people saw the chaos that came from this rush to divorce. Mm -hmm. So in 1980, divorce hit a peak okay. and it's come down pretty dramatically ever since then. And so now, depending on how you sort of measure it, it's come down anywhere from like 33 to 40 something percent mm -hmm. and it's still falling. And so you hear in the news or you hear in a book, you know, well, with divorce rates rising, no, divorce rates have been falling dramatically since wow. 1980. So what is the percentage or approximate percentage <laughs> of people getting divorced? So here is here is the what I think is And I like how the, you have the positive spin on it. I'm yes. excited for about what's about to come. Yes. Here is what I think is one of the best ways of looking at this because and I should say before I say this there are a lot of different ways of calculating a divorce rate, right? Like, does it mean the percentage of people who are likely to get divorced in the future? Does it mean if you have a room of a thousand people, how many people are divorced or have been divorced? Is it men versus women? Is it age groups? There's like so many different ways of calculating this. But one of the numbers that I think is actually a pretty good one, like, and it, it's a fairly conservative number, um, is that 71% of people, and this is according to the Census Bureau, 71% of people are still married to their first spouse. Wow. Okay. So 29% aren't still married to their first spouse. And the key with that to understand, this is really crucial, is that includes, that 29% includes everyone who was married for 50 years and their spouse died. Okay. That's just marriages that have ended. That's death and divorce. No one knows 
what the divorce rate actually is, but you can get closer and we can estimate there's about a 14% rate of widowhood. Um, there's some other factors that you can add in and you can kind of squint sideways and say, maybe there's a 25% divorce rate for first marriages. Now that's still too high, yeah. but it's a universe different from 50%. Wow. And the thing that that does is it allows you to, for yourself, or for a friend mm -hmm. to come alongside someone who's struggling, you can put your arm around them and say, you know what, you're gonna make it. Most people do. Most people do. Yeah, the, the reality, the statement that everybody needs to know is most marriages are strong and happy for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Your second myth is that, that debunks it, is that most marriages are average. And in fact, I think in uh, one of them, um, and you mentioned that it's not true. Why do you think it's not true? And what is the percentage of marriages that are happy? So when you ask people, and I would encourage, not everybody is a nerd like me, but I love like asking average people or friends, okay, what percentage of marriages do you think are happy? Okay, like just try that at some time at a party. Mm -hmm. and, and you're not asking, are you a happy marriage? We're saying, out there yeah. what percentage and so the average answer is oh, maybe 30 percent of marriages are happy maybe a third of marriages the actual percentage is 80 percent 80 percent of marriages on average depending on which we're data both set spouses where both spouses say that they're happy it's usually somewhere around eight out of ten percent eight out of ten and so 80 percent is obviously this massive difference from what we've been told. Mm -hmm. And yet it makes sense. This institution God created, mm -hmm. most people just enjoy being married, right? Most people love being married. Now that doesn't mean there aren't issues at times, mm -hmm. but it is, it, it is an enormous encouragement to think, you know, this institution God created, we haven't broken it, <laughs> you know? And not to jump on any future questions, but there are those couples that aren't happy. Mm -hmm. and, and there is probably, in those cases, they'll go, well, I guess we're in that, we're 20%, in that 20%, so we might as well get divorced, right? So, no, because here's another thing that was fascinating. Uh -huh. There was this massive study that was done a number of years ago. It was a real gold standard. It was done extremely well. There were a bunch of researchers involved. And so, and one of them was a man named Scott Stanley, who's a University of Denver professor, and he's one of the big demographers. He does a lot of this work. So, but there was a bunch of these involved. And what they did was they actually followed people who were at different levels of happiness over the course of many, many years. And they found that if you were very unhappy in your marriage, and yet you stayed committed, and you stayed married for five years, 80% of those marriages that had started off so unhappy were at the highest level of happiness five years later. Wow. And it was kind of, it was interesting. It was mocked at the time um, by a bunch of cynics, because you know, we have a cynical mm -hmm. culture. And so a bunch of universities, whatever, were like, oh, they called it the spontaneous remission study. Like, you know, bad marriages have a spontaneous remission. And, you know, okay, first of all, we know spontaneous remission is a word for miracle right, for God's intervention. But what isn't, <laughs> it's not just a spontaneous miracle. It turns out that one of the factors is that marriage isn't as complicated as people try to make it, and that sometimes some pretty simple things can make a pretty big difference, and commitment is one of those things. And I've seen it as a pastor. I've seen, uh, walked alongside few marriages where honestly, even I didn't think they'll make it. Oh, gosh. And I was like, oh man, of course I wouldn't tell them that I don't think they, they could make it, would encourage them. And, and seeing 10 years later, not only they made it, I think somebody said that it's like a marriage that went through even something like infidelity, where yeah. they had a reason to leave. They had a yes. biblical excuse to leave and they stood by their spouse 
of course, we're not talking about abusive. Um, we're not talking about unrepentant, hard heart. We're talking about people who chose to forgive, chose to get help. Yeah. And then I remember uh, working with one couple and then the, the wife told me something. She's like, they went to a counselor and the counselor said, she said, this happened and there was an adultery that, that took place. And she said, it, it broke. He's like, it's like a broken bone. You'll never forget that it happened. The scars will be there all the time for the rest of your life, it, even after it gets healed. But she said the counselor told her this, that when the bone gets healed, that bone, after it's broken, is stronger than the bone that was never broken. Huh. And she said, when he said that, she said, I realized that though, I'll, and the counselor told her, she's like, he told her, he said, you'll never forget that that bone was broken. You know, you'll always remember that it was broken. He says it won't hurt again, but it will be stronger than the bones that were not broken. And she said, that brought me so much encouragement. And today, you know, years later, not only they're faithful in church, the children, their life. And when I look at them, their marriage is a source of blessing to other people. And so when I hear, uh, you know, those things about that, those 20% of people that are not happy. And I read in your book, you know, they stay five years committed, try to work on their marriage. They come to the other side and they experience that happiness. And then you actually cited studies also that people who decide to get divorced, this doesn't necessarily improve their happiness. It doesn't. And that's the hard part of this. It's, it's interesting. We, on the plane, on the way here, um, because I hit up every, I interview every man I come across and the guy sitting next to us on the airplane. I'm like, so talk to me about your relationship. Like, I don't want to know your name or, you know, anything about you. So he starts talking about how he's committed to his wife. He was like a, you know, good old boy. He's like, excuse my friend. She was talking about all these things. But he said, you know, I see people who have been married for some number of years and then they go somewhere because I think the grass is going to be greener. And, and he, he says, 23 years and you think the grass is going to be greener? Are you kidding? You throw away 23 know, huh? years. And so he said, I hate to tell you this, the grass is never greener. Like it's just different grass and you're going to have the same you're gonna have different issues, but you're gonna have issues. And the way he put it, he said, that very act of changing to try to find the greener grass itself is gonna create problems. And that's one of the things that obviously, again, we are not talking about cases of abuse, for example, but one of the things that is just statistically true is that you are going, even if you leave one human to marry another human, you're marrying a human, right? Like you are going to have issues. They just Plus you're the same person. Different, and right. you're the same the person. The common denominator in all the problems. <laughs> and so, yes, God wants his children to live in peace, but what he's built and what his heart is, is for that original marriage to become a source of joy and become a source of strength. And of course, it doesn't always work out that way, but it's encouraging to know that in many cases it can. And um, the third myth, a lot of times is used against Christians. Yeah. Um, this is a lot of times spoken in the church by a pastor or during a revival service, bring conviction, remind us how messed up we are as Christians, how much world we have allowed in our life. and. You know, the divorce rate is the same among the Christians as it is among those who are not Christians. And like in my mind, I, I looked at in our church, I was like, it doesn't seem that way. But I was like, you know, maybe it's in other churches. Right. And so, but you have done a deeper dive and found out that not to be true. No, it's not. It's that is based on a misunderstanding mm -hmm. of a George Barna study. And, and you know George Barna personally. And I do. And and I've actually talked to him about this. Because and he's a good man. He's a good, I mean, he's, he's a been good a good... He wasn't trying to actually say no. that. They just misunderstood it. It was misunderstood. See, here's the, the issue is that we say the rate of divorce is the same in the church because of what George Barna found. And he didn't because he wasn't studying people in the church. What he was studying at the time was belief systems. So you call people on the phone and, you know, are you a Christian? Are you a Muslim? Are you Jewish? Are you a religious nun? Are you an atheist? Those groups had the same divorce rate. 
but he specifically excluded whether they went to church from the analysis because that wasn't what he was trying to study. And so what I did is I partnered with Barna and I bought that data set and we re-ran all the numbers, but with that one factor added back in of, okay, let's look at whether the person was in church last week. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are a, a follower of Jesus. But, it's, but that's it's, the data it's, that it's we happened to have. Yeah, we just happened, that they had asked a couple of things that weren't included, and one of them was, were you in church last week, basically. Um, I'm not saying the question exactly right, but it was basically that. And if the person was in church last week, according, by the way, not just to Barna, but literally every other study that's ever been done, the divorce rate plummets anywhere from 25 to 50%. Now, and there was actually this Harvard study that came out just a couple of years ago that found that amongst regular church attenders, the divorce rate fell 58%. And so there's this massive difference for people who attend church. Now, if you're talking about what the divorce rate is, like that first myth, mm -hmm. you're gonna have every demographer in the country arguing different numbers, right? Like there's all this disagreement about what the numbers are. There is literally no disagreement about this issue. Every demographer knows wow. that church goers have this incredible protectiveness over their marriages. Why it's just that? that every pastor doesn't know that. But why is that it helps people's marriages when they go to church? Well, if you think about it, right, God says, don't give up the habit of meeting together, right? And one of the things that we are told to do for some mysterious, miraculous reason is to come together with other believers in worship and teaching and fellowship and prayer and I think one of the reasons that God tells us to do this is it's not just our, to build our relationship with Him, mm -hmm. but with our relationship with each other. And the most important, each other, mm -hmm. is your spouse. And God knows it's protective. One of the, statistically, one of the big factors is that um, in church community, you're in community. Yeah. And so if there's an issue there, someone's going to notice yeah. and they're going to come alongside you and say, can we do anything? Can we have you over for dinner? The majority of churches around the United States, they're smaller churches. Mm. Yes. Yeah, there's right. not a lot of mega churches, uh, you know, and so in smaller churches, you know each other. Right. Yes. You know, they know you when you don't show up, when something's happening, you, you pretty much connect with them. And so, and I was thinking about uh, understanding, you know, how in the world, uh, when you're not a follower of Jesus, your commitment is to your spouse. In Christian faith, your commitment is first to God. Secondly, your commitment is to the institution of marriage yeah. and then to your spouse. <laughs> it's almost like you got two layers of accountability before you even yeah. get to your spouse. And so and at first that might not seem romantic when you're dating to tell, hey, I'm not going to be just committed to you. I'm committing to the, uh, the guy upstairs. I'm committing to his institution. And then, of course, I'm yeah. committing to you. And to think about, like I was reflecting on my relationship when I was reading uh, your statistics, I was reflecting on my relationship with God and just what it does to me. How does it bless my marriage? And it dawned on me how my God, our God, is a try on God one God in three persons, that means our God understands the complexities of being equal and yet we have different like Jesus submits to the Father yet never complains about why did I have to die on the cross. So this idea of wife submitting to the husbands yet wife and the husband were equal, we're together, we're the same yet we have certain orders, certain um, uh, God's uh, certain callings and to be able to have diversity and unity Nobody models that better for eternity than our God. That means when I get closer to Him, He pretty much oozes upon me. Hey, this is how we do it with my Son and the Holy Ghost. Y'all can figure this out. We've been doing this for eternity. You've been doing this for 12, 10 years. You got this. We're going to help you. And that to me became such a huge encouragement that I have a, an example in heaven. Yeah, I love that. That... I love Lives that. On earth. Yeah, yeah. One one person somewhere in the process of the research or somewhere, I love the analogy that they said. You're committed to your marriage. You know, you said you're committed to God first, then the institution of marriage. They said you need to see marriage as if it was a baby. 
that baby requires both of you to care for the baby. This is your, your marriage is the institution, the thing that you are, that is outside yourself that you are caring for. And it needs to have love and care and attention poured on it. And if it's a baby, you do it, right? Like, cause you know about it, but so often on our marriages, we don't think of it that way. And it's this outside force that we're supposed to attend to. Now, the myth number four. Now, I would say um, I was the one that has uh, propagated this myth. Oh, no. So we I am did going too. To, I am going to just make a public apology uh, on that, is that if second marriages, and, and my intentions were right to encourage people not to get married, not to, to get divorced, to get married again. Um, but sometimes people get married second time because their spouse passed away. Sure. So second marriages doesn't always involve a spouse that was divorced, a spouse maybe that was a widow. But second marriages have a higher percent of divorce rate and you know 50% is the first marriage and of course we bump it to 10%, 60% is the second marriage and the third marriage is 70% and then we usually don't say the fourth one because it's 80 and then the, the fifth one is 90. And so you say that that's not true. You know, the, the, the funny thing about this is it's plausible what you're hearing, okay. what, you, what we've heard about this, because you think that in the cases where there was a divorce initially, in the second marriage, you may be bringing in ex kids from both marriages. Yeah. That creates challenges. Potentially it, it does, conflict. Mm -hmm. for real. You may have someone who's married not just the second time, the third time. And you're thinking, well, it was easy for them to say, I want divorce to be an option one, two times. So it makes sense that it should be mm -hmm. higher. higher. And it turns out, yeah, it may make it like it may, you may think, okay, that's logical, but it turns out our belief in those numbers, it's just a myth. So we, we, this is one of those areas where I was bound and determined as part of the research. I'm like, I am going to find that study, you know, 50%, 60%, 70 We've all seen those. I'm going to find the study because I want to know what the methodology was like, right? Like with the Barna study, it was all about the methodology and they didn't include church attendance. So I wanted to find this out. And so we spent, we, my senior researcher and I spent three years trying to trace this, three years and trying to trace all the citations for that, those numbers. And they all traced back to three sources that actually don't exist. It turns out that this particular thing is a pure urban legend, those numbers. Yeah. And so the, the, the funniest one, my favorite one, is that, and if you see this, by the way, just know this is an urban legend. Um, it, there's a widely quoted Psychology Today article mm -hmm. that says that Dr. Jennifer Baker at the oh, Forest Institute, yep, yeah, that Dr. Jennifer Baker at the Forest Institute says that there's this 50, 60, 70%. And so we emailed her, very well respected researcher, and we said, can we get access to your study mm -hmm. to see how you got these numbers? She emailed us back all in capital letters <laughs> and it said, that's not me. I never said that. I've been trying to get them to take my name off that website for years. Oh it's literally just an urban legend. There were so, there were several of those. Like I said, there were three sources and they were all like that. And so we, again, we don't know what this, like the second marriage divorce rate is. Again, just like the first marriage, we don't know the exact numbers, but we can get closer. Just like 71% of people are still married to their first spouse, 65% are still married to their second spouse. And the 35, and so 35% aren't. And remember that's death and divorce. And now think about it. If you're in a second marriage, you're probably getting married at older ages. And so it is highly possible that a higher number in there is death mm -hmm. than it was in the yeah. first marriages. Yeah. And so it is possible that second marriages actually have a lower divorce rate than first marriages. And again, we don't oh. know uh -huh. because the numbers don't aren't kept that way. But the, 
the good news regardless is that you can go just like into a first marriage, you can go into your second marriage knowing that your marriage will probably last for a lifetime. You don't That's need to do the things mm -hmm. to like protect yourself, like a little bank account on the side that you're thinking, well, I got to have because I'm, it's probably not going to work. That can create a lack of trust, build mm -hmm. the wall and create the problem you're trying to protect yourself from. Wow. That's so encouraging. Yeah. I think everybody that's watching this right now, this is like uh, probably a breath of fresh air, for especially so. for those of you in the second marriage. Because, you know, the first marriage, yeah, I get it. You might have fear, but it's in the second marriage. There's a lot of times, there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of guilt, especially when the previous one ended in divorce. Yeah. And um, now the, the last myth that I want to highlight today is that Marriage problems are caused by major issues. So big things need to happen to fix those issues. <laughs> so here is the, the good news. And it's, very, it's a very fun uh, thing to talk about, which is that most marriage problems actually aren't from the big ticket problems, right? Like, yes, those big things exist. Like somebody was sexually abused as a child. It's a pretty big deal and it you can see how it would carry into the marriage for example yes those things happen but it turns out those aren't the majority of issues and that instead most of the time you've got a husband and a wife who really care about each other and they're both trying hard but what's happening is they're trying hard in the wrong areas or they're hurting each other and it's all these little day-to-day -day issues that are being caused that they don't realize are happening and suddenly when your eyes are open to maybe some things that are going on on the inside of your spouse like what we covered in the other episode and some of these things you can suddenly try hard in the right areas and it just makes everything flow so much better and so that myth that you know it's all this big complicated stuff marriage is hard and complicated and i mean that's really discouraging you know you think you have to have a phd in psychotherapy to be married well no it god would not give us this institution that was incredibly complicated and instead little things really do really really do make a big difference i think it was uh in your book you mentioned that marriages are not hard but sometimes marriages go through a hard time yeah. and i'm probably paraphrasing this or they endure a hard time but overall marriages are not hard and that just was so encouraging um even kind of reading for me as a as a young leader as a young also married person that marriages are not hard but sometimes you have to work hard on your marriage for a season yeah. to get it good and then you just pretty much you keep it in that maintenance mode. It's not difficult. It's not. And I love the positivity and the faith and the good news that you bring I, I, into marriage. I, I, honestly, if you will approach your marriage and your spouse with curiosity, why did she do that? Not in a sense of why did she do that or what is going on inside of her? Let me I got to figure that out. Yeah. And not just throw up your hands and say, never going to understand it. But if you will be curious about your spouse, if you'll be curious mm -hmm. about your marriage, I wonder what our lives will be like mm -hmm. in 10 years if we keep on this trajectory. All of that stuff is great. And it's not that hard to do. It's not checking out. It is noticing things and then just putting in a little bit of energy. And, and being encouraged that that little bit of energy here and there and working on it and awareness will yield these big differences. Because in your book on highly happy, uh, highly happy marriages, you talk about that as well, how it's the little things. A lot of times people think it's the big things, but it's the little things. Even like one of them that you mentioned, a, it's it's the little things believing that your spouse has good intentions about you yeah. when you are hurt I mean it doesn't even take any effort it's just you adjust your attitude that's and that's it and then you begin to notice the difference 
that that plays just the little thing so a lot of times we think that it's going to be such a big thing that we need to do to fix our marriage when in reality if you and today in our in our church service you mentioned that it's like if you would just do this one thing believe that your spouse has the best intentions about you and you you quote that 99 percent of spouses deeply care about each other yeah 99.26 percent wow yeah and it, so in other words when you're believing the best of their intentions this isn't like a positive psychology yeah. exercise wishful stuff. thinking you're not making stuff up this is actually true and the thing is we often sabotage our marriages because i let myself believe when i'm hurt I think to myself, you know, he knew how that would make me feel and he said it anyway. And I don't realize what I'm trans what that translates to is he doesn't care about me, which is ridiculous. Like if I sat and thought about it, of course I know he cares about me. Or if you sit and think about it, you know your wife appreciates you or whatever. And so, but when you can choose, like literally put a sticky note on your mirror that says believe the best and it's not believing the best of what they always do because we could all be jerks <laughs> to one another but believe the best of their intentions towards you i think that um what you've shared today and, and i love how you mentioned in, in the church today one of the reasons why these myths thrive because be, because the enemy loves the fact yeah. that by spreading these even if some people do it unintentionally spreading these lies myths he can disperse hopelessness yeah that's right and the other part is that we live in a culture that consumes negativity yeah. are drawn i mean our, our the most foods that we consume are junk foods people love quick uh, fast i was telling our church last last week about the only airplanes you see on the news are the ones that crash i was talking about how sometimes we uh, people come up to me they're like it seems like every popular pastor is immoral um, every famous pastor falls. And I said, well, for every famous pastor, pastor that falls, there's thousands of faithful right. yes. who don't. It's just yes. nobody mentions them anywhere on the news right. because nobody's going to read about that because we consume scandals. We consume, we like, you know, the controversy and all of this stuff. Our generation loves that. And so it's the clickbait. And so and I think we have to be people of truth. Our God is the God of truth. Jesus is the way and the truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The truth sets people free. And so what you guys heard today is that we presented a lot of the things that the culture said. And we also were, this is not just something we believe to be true, therefore it's true. Uh, Shanti and her husband, and as well as an, a team of researchers dove deep into this so that you can be reassured for years, spent time and resources to bring good news to you. Not based on just this is what we want to be true, but this is what the fact is on the ground and to bring the cookies, put them on the bottom shelf for the rest of us to eat them. And you know, speaking of the good news cookies, right? Speaking of this, truly the thing that's really, really even more encouraging, since the book came out, mm -hmm. the news just keeps getting better and better and better. Like the statistics just keep getting better and better. The divorce rate keeps falling. You know, these things that we've been talking about, they're even better today than they were a But few is years it true ago. also that people are getting married less and cohabitating? So they are, but it's not the reason for the falling divorce rate. Okay. There was actually a mathematician because that's a, a one of the things that people will say, well, uh -huh. it's just they're just not getting, they're yeah. just not yeah. getting married. Uh -huh. That's and, what I, that's and, what and I heard. So, uh -huh. Yeah, and so that's why the divorce rate is falling. And a mathematician actually studied that. Her name is Dana Rotz. And she did this big study out of Harvard of what is responsible for the fall, the decline in the divorce rate, because it, it makes sense. Maybe it is that people are living together. And yes, that the cohabitation rate is a piece of it, but it's only a small piece. It actually turns out the reason the divorce rate's been falling so much is that people are getting married at older ages and that's protective as well. Because when you get married very young, those groups actually do have a higher divorce rate. And yet if you get married at slightly older ages, you know, from 24 to 25 to 26 to 27, you're more mature and you have a lower and lower and lower chance of divorce. When we got married, I was 32 when we got married. 
if I was 20, I was a knucklehead. <laughs> I, mean, I was 24 and I was, yes, and I was, was an idiot. Say, and and I was a pastor. Yeah. <laughs> so you, th that makes sense uh -huh. to me. Yes. Uh -huh. So just. I'm like, I wonder how my parents made it. But see, the divorce was not an option. Murder, right? murder was, divorce was yeah. not an option. Yeah. It was like an Islam kind of a fate. You just couldn't. There, there was no way that, getting that out. That just you know? wasn't even. Yeah. And you know yeah. what? That also is protective. Huge. Again, That's true. not in cases of abuse, yes. etc. Yes. But that concept is mm -hmm. actually very protective. So get yourself into a legalistic church. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But it does, it does help to have a view of marriage that's hopeful, positive, and we're not afraid of divorce. But we have faith that God created this institution yeah. to both shape our character, to protect us from temptation, for the betterment of our society, for the development of our children to provide, you know, because when two elephants fight, grass suffers, you know. When we walk in that unity, our children are raised up and they raise up and they are raised up in a healthy environment. And so we want to encourage each and every one of you. Any final thoughts that you have toward marriage and where can people find more information to better their marriage? I final think thoughts. final thought, I mean, to me, the biggest thing is realize you can have hope for your marriage. If there is a sense, if there has been a sense of, oh my gosh, we're never going to get through this. Yes, you are. Right? Like most people do that. Remember that thing about staying married for five years and 80% of people being very happy, not just middling, not just kind of just surviving, very happy five years later, you can do this. Just recognize that you actually have to do this. Like, put some attention into yeah. what are those little things that matter it, and make a commitment yourself to do and, and that's exactly right that's where i was going to go the commitment mm -hmm. the long-term commitment if you just make one small we all want to have the big change spin <laughs> around real quick and make everything great oftentimes life doesn't work that way if you have that long-term view that long-term commitment then just a few degrees of correction here and there, but practiced every day over a long period of time, the difference of where you're getting is dramatically different. That's incredible. And uh, the website is shanti.com. Go to shanti.com and you can see all of this data there. I would highly encourage you guys, and we didn't touch on the the surprising secrets of highly happy marriages we just touched on one briefly about assuming the best but i would encourage you to get these books and as, as a pastor as a leader maybe of the church um, on their website there's a lot of resources for leaders as well that will really equip you to present the truth not just repeat what everybody else has been saying and actually be wrong about it <laughs> Because now if your people are going to watch this interview, they're going to confront you. So, uh, so you can present the truth and bring hope to people because God's truth not only liberates them, but brings them hope. Thank you for watching. Until next time, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and drop in the comments what did you learn? What thing caught you by surprise? Until next time.